you know, this is the way that we're reaching our young people. This is the way that the Great Commission is being fulfilled through our schools. So if I, if God is willing to use me in any capacity to further that, I couldn't, I couldn't say no. Well, welcome to another episode of the Leadership 360 podcast. I've been looking forward to this episode because I get to have a conversation with one of our associate superintendents, but more importantly, I get to have a conversation with Robin Grimsley, <laughs> who her office is just down the hall from mine. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about Robin is that you have an infectious laugh <laughs> that is heard throughout the building. <laughs> But I love, especially when you do work, your your intentionality and your insight into not only things education, but also just into spirituality is absolutely amazing. I always love um, having you um, when we do when you do worship for us here in the office. I always walk away saying, "Wow, I never saw that before," or something. Wow, so, Tom. so Robin, thank you for joining me. I would have come on here sooner if I knew it was going to be full of compliments. <laughs> you can give me the twenty after we're done. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> but uh, Robin, you're fairly new to the Texas Conference office here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you and I came in a couple of months apart. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about your story. How in the world did you end up as an associate superintendent? That's a really interesting question uh, because for – so I've been in education for a little bit over two decades. Okay. And for – about half of that, I was actually against Adventist education. I thought it was a waste of money. I thought it was frivolous. Um, and then God decided that he was going to open my eyes. <laughs> so someone who thought that people were just throwing their money away ended up teaching in an Adventist school. And it was just within a couple of months that I realized that this is a necessity. This is an evangelism unit. We're preparing children uh, to know Christ, teaching them day by day, moment by moment. And it was really whenever I started working in our system, you see, I let me back up sure. just a little bit. So I am the only Seventh-day Adventist in my family. Okay. I became gotcha. an Adventist through Friendship Evangelism whenever I was 13 or 14 years old. Um, I didn't know anything about Adventist education, but whenever I learned about it, that's whenever I started thinking, hey, this is a waste of money, right? Sure. <clears throat> so my entire educational experience was in secular institutions. And teaching in a secular school, you know, I'm spending eight hours a day without Jesus. That was what I did. I went to work, came home, but nowhere in my work day, nowhere in my school day when I was younger, did I stop and have moments with Christ or ask for help when I didn't understand something. And whenever I started working in our classrooms, I was able to teach my students to bring everything to Christ, you know, we're having math. I, I worked with little ones. So okay, right. our prayers might be as simple as, thank you, Jesus, for math. Please help us to learn today. And through that, through helping them to problem solve by focusing on our Christian values and who we are and why we act certain ways, getting at the roots, I saw, okay, these connections that these students have through everything they're going through all day is also available to me. So for a large chunk of my life, I had missed out on this core element of being a Christian. You know, when you think of American society, you think of the basic tenets, our cultural, um, who we are as Americans. You think I can do it by myself. Right. I'll figure it out, pull myself up by my bootstraps. Straps, but Especially Texans. Yes, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> we can handle it. We were our own country. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> and don't you forget it Exactly. Either. So that's not Christian. That's not a Christian tenant. We are supposed to take everything to Christ. So what was that tipping point? You said, you know, you thought it was a waste of money. And then what was it? Was it actually being in the classroom that really made that? How did how did you even make that decision to go from secular public school into <laughs> into Adventist education? Because a lot of people with that would be like, there's no way I'm working for this, this yeah. educational system. So it was one of our recessions that we had. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Public ISDs had stopped hiring. Okay. I had gone to a secular private institution, and it was actually in Puerto Rico. I worked over there oh, for a okay. bit, and I came back to the States because um, well, salaries aren't as high there. Sure, <laughs> it was sure. harder to save for retirement. When I came back, there was a hiring freeze. Uh, 
And God said, I'm going to give you this opportunity to see the truth about Adventist education. So the tipping point was whenever I started seeing the connection that I was trying to instill in my students and that I could have that connection. And to answer your original question, I became associate superintendent solely through the hand of God. So I've worked in our system for over a decade, and I became a principal for an amount of time, and then I was offered this opportunity, and I said yes to serving in this capacity. It's and been a blessing. And you've taught in a very, I mean, you, you taught at Houston, Houston Adventist Academy, mm -hmm. Oaks, back back then. Mm -hmm. Then you became principal at Fort Worth Junior Academy. Fort Worth Adventist Junior Academy. Adventist Junior Academy. Mm -hmm. Fwaja is Fwaja. how I know it as. And then you received the opportunity to come be an associate superintendent. I'm kind of curious, what did you ever, obviously not growing up in the system, you never like, oh, my career goal is to one day be an associate no. superintendent or the superintendent at the conference office. What, how did God work in your life to bring you to be an associate? Because it can be very intense. intimidating yeah. and intense and <clears throat> there's no downtime Again, as God opened the door, what was what was that? Wow, okay, yeah, maybe God, this is what you want me to do. So I started out in education saying I never want to be an administrator. I remember those first few years and seeing I had an excellent principal whenever I first started in secular education. And seeing the things that he had to deal with and navigate, I said, absolutely not, that's not for me. Um, whenever I became, uh, whenever I joined the Adventist system, it was a few years in and uh, actually, if you're a teacher, there is help and funding for you to get a master's degree. Right. And one of them that was offered was administration, educational leadership and administration. So I chose to follow that. Um, and honestly, the, o the only reason that I accepted the position is because I have so much respect for my boss, Dr. Keisha Norris. <laughs> she She's low-key genius. She's humble. She knows how to do things effectively. I just, I appreciate her leadership. And She's one of those leaders that you want to follow. So whenever she called and had the conversation with me about what it would entail, um, I I couldn't say no. Sure. It's an opportunity to work very closely with someone that I respect. I appreciated her vision and mission for the direction of Adventist education and to continue to serve this institution that I'm so passionate about. You know, this is the way that we're reaching our young people. This is the way that the Great Commission is being fulfilled through our schools. So if I, if God is willing to use me in any capacity to further that, I couldn't, I couldn't say no, even though uh, that form of leadership had never been one of my aspirations. You know, and having I've worked with Adventist schools my entire ministry, um, and it's amazing the team that you guys have. Mm -hmm. The the synergy, and I know that's an overused term, but seriously, the synergy that Keisha and the rest of you, Levi Smith, you all have mm -hmm. together. I mean, it 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 is awesome to to walk past your offices or if you're across the hall in the conference room working together. I love the collaboration. I love the synergy because you guys bring different gifts and talents to to the table. And I love seeing that because good teams really are the ones that succeed the most. Absolutely. It it really is ordained. It's selected by God because to have something where we each complement each other with our strengths and weaknesses so much is only through his hand. Yeah. So you have your cheat sheet, cheat <laughs> sheet there. So I'm going to let you refer to that, but, but I really want our listeners. And again, to, to just remind those who are listening, um, we designed this podcast for our leaders in our churches, mm -hmm. not only here in the Texas Conference, but but throughout the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I think sometimes we take things for granted. You know, we've we've had some conversations mm -hmm. in the past about how the money works, how how the the church system works. And I think Adventist education is one of those things that we kind of take for granted. Yeah, we know we have church schools. What is the what's the thing we say? We have the largest parochial system outside of Catholicism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. throughout the world. So we have Adventist education as a very fundamental part of our our ministry. But I think many people in the local church are like, okay, yeah, there's an Adventist school here, there's an Adventist mm -hmm. school there. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. Talk to us about what is the state of Adventist education? How many elementary schools? How many academies? What does it look like here in the Texas Conference? Well, we have 22 schools across the beautiful and glorious state of Texas, all the way from South Texas. We have several located in the Hill Country. 
We have several in the Houston Metroplex, as well as East Texas, and then here in DFW. And our schools really work to serve the needs of their communities. So they'll start anywhere from preschool, pre-kindergarten, or kindergarten, okay. depending on the community, go up to eighth grade. 10th grade or 12th grade. We actually have seven schools right now that graduate out 12th graders into the real world. Um, And some of the things that I'm really proud of, a lot of our academies are doing, uh, our, our senior academies are doing dual credit. In fact, there was one school last year where if the kiddos had chosen to take the classes, they were able to graduate with 21 college hours. Wow. Do you know how much money that saved That's parents? That's a lot of that. No, no, no. Trust me. <laughs> having a college age soon. I know what higher education costs. It ain't cheap. Yeah. So, um, so we have roughly 2,000, almost 2,200 students, 2,100 something, okay. right? And we fluctuate a little bit through the year which is a 4% increase from our student populations last year. And we have roughly 180 teachers. Okay. Um, yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of teachers. It is a lot of teachers. And, and it goes from, and I want to kind of just tweak the, you know, talk about the nomenclature because we, mm-hmm. so we have elementary schools. Do we have one room schools where there's one teacher in the we classroom? We do. We have two one room schools. Um, one of them is in Coggin, uh, or excuse me, it's in Corpus Christi okay. called Coggin Memorial right. School. The other is in Garland, Garland Adventist Christian School. We have some schools that have three teachers, uh, four teachers, five teachers, and then we start getting into some larger numbers after that. So how does, so these churches, we have 22 different schools throughout the conference. Mm-hmm. All of them are affiliated with or in our nomenclature, churches are constituents of the local school. So they're affiliated with. Yes, yeah. How does that work? So if if I'm part of a church that has a church school, um, and I'm trying to think of one that has multiple multiple churches, you know, whether it's, uh, let's use Houston, Mm -hmm. who has multiple. How does that work? How does the, what does this constituency mean when I'm a constituent church of a church school? It means that you support Really, okay. that and that word support encompasses many arenas. Primarily, we're looking prayer, prayerful oh, support, wow. okay. right? So not financial first oh. and foremost. Prayer, I like that. Well, that's what like we're that. about because if you pray, everything else will come, right? If we are Adventists, are praying people. We trust our God. We trust His promises. So primarily, right, our first duty is our spirituality. Our first thought is how can we connect with Christ? So I know that our constituent churches, our our members, our congregants, our pastors, our leaders, elders, and deacons, praying, praying. I love that. Praying. praying. <laughs> That's all right. I got the no, I like that. No, and, and I appreciate that, Robin. And I know that is something that your team um, really embodies in the sense that so often we think of the financial. Okay, what is the church? But I love the fact that you're saying, no, 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 finances are a part of it. And we get to that. Finances in a second. are a large part of it. You're right. But first, first and, and foremost, foremost, I love that. Yeah. Well, it's who we are, right? That's whenever we talk, whenever I talk to people, that's what I'm asking them for. That's what we need because God will provide the finances. He has everything, everything belongs to right. Him. So, yes, churches do support, our constituent churches do support financially. They will give a subsidy to. Um, to the school to support and assist with all of the finances. Running a school is very expensive. (laughs) It is an investment. It is an important investment, but it is also an expensive investment. Um, And then we have churches that are not constituent churches. They often give a subsidy to their members to support, to allow for students to receive Adventist education. So support, prayer, finances are very important. Um, but there's also the moral and partnership support. I'm just going to give kind of a list of things that I've seen over the years. Sure. Um, I've seen pastors doing uh, baptismal classes on campus, chapels, week of prayer. I've had pastors come to my classroom to pray with me before the start of the school year or in the middle of the school year. Uh, career day, we've had pastors do career day, coaching different sports teams, soccer basketball, you name it. You guys, you pastors are super athletic. <laughs> <laughs> and super competitive. But yes, anyway, that's that, all different conversation. That, um, I've also had members that are volunteering during the day for tutoring, pullouts to help students uh, after school, 
doing lunches, uh, before and after care, just finding needs that there are on the campus and meeting those needs. There's two schools that I'm thinking of right now that have a a grandmother that has adopted a Mm -hmm. class. So one goes every Thursday and she reads books and interacts with the children. Another one does crafts and connects it to something that they're learning in class or a little bit of an older group. There's also a... um, Oh, what was the other one? I've completely lost my train of thought. That's all right. That's all right. It <laughs> happens. So, oh, <clears throat> yeah. We'll come back to you. It'll, it'll hit you. I, because, I want it, because one of the things I do want to cover is how do churches support? How can churches and leaders support that? But before we jump into that, I, I want you to talk a little bit more, because you've alluded to it you know, as part of your story. What do you see? as the distinct advantages to Adventist education. Mm. Because one thing you will hear, and, and you you said it earlier, man, it costs a lot of money for me to send my kid to Adventist mm-hmm. education. I can send them down the road to the public school for free. Mm-hmm. I'm paying my taxes anyway. What do you see as the distinct advantages of Seventh-day Adventist Christian education? First is Christ, right? What I spoke about earlier with Teachers, what I did, what I see our teachers doing, the reason that we're in Adventist education is to teach children who Christ is and who he's supposed to be to them. So our first advantage is that kids are in a safe environment where they're learning how to deal with real-world problems, real-world experiences, but from a Christian Adventist viewpoint. So whenever you have uh, disagreements or behavior problems, you're able to address them from the spiritual aspect of who is your neighbor? Why sure. do you love them? Why do you treat them this way? Whenever I worked in public and I had these same issues, because kids are kids and they're going to be kids anywhere, um, I was only able to address the symptoms. Don't hit little Johnny because it's not nice. Right. But I wasn't able to go at it from, say, Ephesians 4.32, right? Be kind and loving to each other and express, explain what that is. Help our kids to really sure. understand in depth what a Christian is through their behavior, through the academics, when we're connecting it, we're able to explain from our scientific standpoint right. who God is as our creator and what he's made. So not only are they receiving their spiritual connection to Christ, but in their academics, they're also being connected to him. Um, something else is when I worked, and I'm going to compare my personal experience. Sure. No, that- that's all, that's all that's you have. All that's I what you have. have. Exactly. <laughs> so when I worked in public um, and at the secular private institution, I I would try to create a family atmosphere. I would try to create a classroom where kids cared for each other and supported each other. Um, and it was tough. Oftentimes it was an uphill battle. I remember a lot of tears and frustration and prayer because the behavior was um, I wasn't able to address the core root. I couldn't figure out at that point, I couldn't figure out why can't I help these kids to care about each other where they're nice to each other at at the base minimum. Whenever I entered the Adventist system, that was innate in who we were. We in the classroom are a mirror of the family at home, right? These teachers are spending more time with these kids than their parents yeah, are. Absolutely. They're having more contact time, more influence. And many parents are happy for that. So anyway, no. <laughs> Sorry, that was a great point that I just totally stepped on. <laughs> so knowing that the person who's teaching your kid, having more contact time with them, has the same moral standpoint as you, because our teachers are baptized Seventh-day Adventists in good standing. That is a qualifier to be able to work in our schools. Right knowing that I can trust this person whenever my child is hurting to point them to Christ, knowing that if we're learning academics and we enter a challenging subject because we're going to hit subjects that go against our belief set, and it's from then whenever we're reading a book or something catches us off guard, we're able to have intelligent conversations saying, okay, let's stop and let's examine this. Let's analyze it. We're able to teach our children how to be thinkers from biblical perspectives. So knowing that you can trust the teacher to lead your children how they're supposed to be led because it does mirror that family aspect. But but what happens when that ideal is not reached? Our schools are not perfect because mm-hmm. we're not perfect. Mm-hmm. 
we've had some folk I've again in, in almost 30 years of ministry say, man, I went through Avenue school and I had this bad experience, this bad mm-hmm. experience, this bad experience. Well then Avenue education, you know, it, it, it's like that across the board. How do you deal with those, those people when we do fall short in terms of, of whether it's teachers or parents, I mean, again, it's a, it's a team, team collaborative educational because the parents are a very important part of the of the system. And that's what I love about, you know, Avenus education is that we recognize the parents are, even though you as the teacher in the classroom are spending more time with my kids during the week than I am, mm-hmm. the parents still an integral part of, oh, of the educational system. Absolutely. But what do we do when we fall short mm-hmm. and say, okay, yeah, we've we've had these bad experiences in the past. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, so if we're talking about a child that is currently having the bad experience, it's important for the parents to communicate with the school okay. and the school to communicate with the parents. We cannot do it without each other, right? Because we're all working on the same team and we're all influencing the child. So it's important that we have open and candid dialogues so that whatever adjustments need to be made can be made um, so that we can make sure that the kiddo's experience is the best that it can be. And Whenever we're talking about adults, you know, that's that's a really hard question because this is their life experience. This is the mm-hmm. things that they've gone through. So it's those moments when we have to examine life as a whole and its personal reflection of, is anything perfect? And this was my experience, but just because I had this, does that mean that it's universal? Because I, I do have a friend and who went through Adventist education, like I said, I didn't, but she didn't have a positive experience. But having conversations with her now, because I know other people that were in the same class with her and their experience was totally different. Sure. She realizes that it was great for them. And it she, she says that it helps her to become stronger. She realized that mm. her faith wasn't based on the experience that she had in that school or in that moment in time, but her faith is based on the instruction that she might have received, right, in Christ yeah. through the home, through the church, and some of it through the school. But I think yeah. I think whenever you're dealing with peer issues and things like that, um, there's a lot of heart searching that has to be done of where where do I receive, where do I have my identity in? So I think that, and, and this is, again, I only know my experience, sure. my perspective. I think that a bad experience in Adventist schools is still a better experience than in a public school because the peers that you're going through these things with um, are still, hopefully, they're all being pointed towards Christ, right? Sure. So they might be making choices that are hurtful at that time, but the entirety of the system, the purpose of it, is to point children to, to Christ. I, I know it doesn't that. have a direct answer. Sure, of, no, 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 do this no, and do this no, 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 no. I appreciate that because again, part of the design of this podcast is asking those questions that normally don't get asked. Yeah. We don't like the, you know, we don't like to talk about. Okay, we yes, Avenus education is is great, but yeah, we've had those people who've had had not so positive experiences, and they've written everything, written it completely off. Um, man, we're running out of time, and I got so much. I love this. <laughs> So, so what I want to do is I'm going to talk to two different church types. Okay. One is I'm going to talk to the leaders of a church who has a church school. Mm-hmm. Again, you said we have 22 different church, church schools around the conference. Multiple schools have multiple constituents. So we're talking probably 40 to 50 churches in one way or another. So let's talk to those 40 or 50 churches here in the, in the conference. How can they better support? We talked about prayer. We talked about finances. How can they better support their local their local school? I think one thing that's really important is the partnership, okay. right? Allowing and asking for a school presence on church and Sabbath, right? In schools, we're training kids to be leaders. We're, we're having chapel every week where the students are leading out. Some students are speaking, musical talents, just that practice of getting up in front and leading. And honestly, if you talk to your church leaders, I'm curious to know, how many of the people that are still active went through Adventist education? I think that's very formative. If we look at who's in charge now, I think that a lot of those people were taken through our Mm -hmm. system. So allowing for those opportunities for it to translate over, and then also supporting if if the school has events, um, seeing how you can be there and be present to help and assist. I know uh, 
of ministries that have stepped into schools to do things that they needed. Like at, when I was at Fwaja, our men's ministry group built, uh, they dedicated the materials and the time to build a Gaga ball pit. So the kids could have a different physical education sure. experience recess. Okay. Anything, just ask your sure. leaders at your school, your teachers, what else do you need? And the teachers and the school leaders should also be asking the church, what else do you need? Getting that synergistic. Sure. Uh, yeah. No, that's a <laughs> going good, back yeah, to that overused exactly. word. But that's really what it is because we're all working for the Great Commission. You know, our schools are an evangelism unit, they are an extension of what's happening in the church. It's an opportunity to continue to plant the seed in little hearts and minds. I, I wanna wanna build on that evangelistic. Obviously, we have students of Seventh day Adventists mm -hmm. in the school. Ballpark, and this is not something that that I prompted you before. Do we have any sense of how many non Seventh day Adventists attending our schools? You know, if you would have asked Levi, he would have split, <laughs> I'm sure I would spit have. out a straight I'm number. I'm sure I would have. I do not know. I, whenever I think I I give a rough estimate, 20 to 40%, okay. depending on what school you're sure. at, what community you're at. But I know every single one of our schools has non Adventist students. And some of them are a larger community school than they, they serve more community students than they serve Adventists. And that's really the data point that I want to make sure that we talked about is that sometimes we think, oh, it's only serving us, mm -hmm. you know, to keep my kids mm -hmm. from public school. But the reality is that it is probably the largest evangelistic opportunity that we have, not only for our kids, mm -hmm. but for kids from the community and parents from the community, because we know very clearly if the kids are interested in something, the parents are coming along. Mm -hmm. And my experience has been in many places, those parents are much more open to some of the Adventism mm -hmm. because their kids are being loved and cared for and taught about Jesus in their in their local school. We have a lot of families that aren't Adventists that see the value in the educational system because of the environment and the experience their kiddos receive. And if you go to church, whenever a school is presenting oh, something, yes. that church, it, you better get there early because you're not going to find seating. There are a lot of non-Adventists right. in that congregation on the Sabbath. I had that experience a, a, a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Um, was in one of our one of our school churches that supported a local school, mm -hmm. and the school had a predominant part of the of the service. And yeah, it was hard to find a seat, <laughs> and it was just really cool to see the church embracing these parents and embracing mm -hmm. their kids as their kids. Mm -hmm. It's your part of our school, you're part of our community, you're part of us. And I and I, mm -hmm. and I love that. Yeah. That's what it's all about. So, what do you say, and I've heard this again over the course <laughs> of my ministry, what do you say when leaders in the church say, "Oh man, if only we didn't have this school, we're sending so much money over to the school mm. for subsidy and support of our students. Mm. Man, what could we do with that money if we mm. didn't have the school? What do you say to leaders who say schools are just a drain on our on our resources, specifically financial resources? So I just recently read a report. Uh, it was based on Barna Group's mm. research. Children are when, as people, we become Christians when we are children. Right. I think it's after the age of 12 and preteen that your percentage chance of becoming a Christian or accepting Christ is just a steep drop off. So the article that I read was saying that um, the author had thought of Christian ministries wrong for the past two decades because they had been concentrating on investing most of their finances in adult ministries. And they realized they were wrong, that it didn't have a large effect Whenever they were investing in adult ministries, they needed to be investing in child evangelism. And that's what our schools are. If we look at our purpose, our purpose as churches, the reason we exist is the Great Commission, that's right. right? We got to spread the three angels message. We need to get people ready. We have one Sabbath a week that we meet for four hours. We have Pathfinders, we have Adventurers, we have Sabbath school, and we have the church school. We are to work together. We have the family unit. And from that family unit, we need to use every tool that God has given, which includes the school, because those eight hours a day, five days a week, we are pointing kids consistently to Christ. So people who think that it's a drain really need to examine where people 
at what age range they're one to Christ. You even have Moses as an example. You know, those 12 years he spent at the feet of his mom mm -hmm. influenced the decision whenever he decided to side with the Israelites right. instead of the Egyptians. So 28 years he spent in the courts of Pharaoh mm -hmm. with, he could have done anything he wanted, but what did he choose? He chose to per, per, to forego the mm -hmm. passing pleasures of sin. Yeah. And that's what we want for our kids. We want our kids now to know who Christ is when they're young so that whenever they're old, they've already made their decision and they choose to continue to renew their fellowship with Christ. So let's say, I thank you for that. I, I love that because again, I've heard it so many times in various settings and, and I think that was the bad man. I could not have come up with a better answer than that because, because <laughs> I do think we sometimes forget that, that if you're even looking at it from a, very base level return on investment. Mm -hmm. Every dollar I spend, what is my return? Mm -hmm. What you're saying is the return on investment is much higher if I spend it on kids. It is. Because they're much, they're at that point in life where they're going to make that much more open to making that decision for Jesus than when they're 20, 30, 40. And again, we're not you know, dismissing adult ministry. It's important. But we also need to, to understand too that this ministry that we have to our kids both Sabbath school and church school is so is so important to growing the yeah. church, but more importantly, as you said, fulfilling that great commission. Yeah. So let's talk to the other 150, 200 churches that don't have church schools that they're affiliated with. What can they do to support Adventist education? Well, the first thing, prayer, right? Okay. Pray for safety, protection, hearts and minds of our young people to be turned towards Christ. And then connect with an area or many area schools and see if they have any needs. Do they need a tutor or pullouts or coaches, anything that can enhance the program? And then there's always finances. Search for children in your congregation that are not attending an Adventist school and see how you can support the families so that they can start to make those steps. Start a, If you don't already have a worthy student fund for your members, begin that um, finances are always going to be a big sticking point because unfortunately many people still have the thought process that I did that it's a luxury instead of a necessity. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that the decisions we're making today are decisions for our children's eternity because the influences that they're constantly exposed to are what forms their hearts and minds and what forms their character. So those financial investments that you're making in children being able to attend Adventist education are investments in their eternity, their salvation. So, so what if, you know, a church is far away? I mean, we, we've, you've alluded to it. We've got a lot of churches <clears throat> far afield in this great big state of Texas. There's not even a church school 100 miles from from me. What can they do to support Christian education? I get it, you know, for churches closer to schools, but what about this church that is far afield from, from a church school? They can still pray. <laughs> no, they can. No, okay. I'm yeah, thinking. absolutely. Prayer. I think it's the same thing. The finances will really help okay. some students to be able to access it. There was a church that was extremely far from Fwaja. But we still received support financially from them. They had no local churches. This is out close to Austin, close okay. to Lynn Passes. Oh, and wow. we had no, they had no schools close to them. Um, and they chose to support Fwaja to help. So I think that um, finances are always going to be a need in Adventist education. Sure. Because we want to allow as many people, as many families to be able to have access to that as possible. So finding families in the area or schools, there's an endowment that the Texas conference okay. has started um, to be able to offer scholarships eventually to students that have financial needs so that Adventist education is financially accessible to everybody. So as we build that endowment to be able to work, to be able to distribute those scholarships, that's a beautiful way that churches without schools around can support into perpetuity. Sure. So... As we're kind of coming to the end, getting ready for the lightning round, I, I want to have you, I always ask my guests, what's the one takeaway? We covered a lot of ground. Wow. Mm -hmm. But what's the one takeaway that you want people to to remember from our, from our conversation? Adventist education is not a luxury. It's a necessity. It, period. Period. I like yeah. that. Stop. Okay. We're done. I mean, I, I can love, say no, no, more. No, no, use your no. finances. Use your prayer time support, yeah. right? Find a way to support, find a way to help. But it, it's, I think that 
um, my mindset was was wrong. And I want to use this opportunity to express that to people, that if, if you have that thought process, if you haven't experienced Adventist education, go and talk to a school, see yeah. what's happening so that you can have a deeper understanding of what Adventist education is, what's happening on the campuses and what it's really about. So reiterating what you said, your takeaway is Adventist education is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how much more we can say. Man, <laughs> that kind of something. up. So I want to get to this lightning round because I've been looking forward to this. Okay. So just for those of you, maybe the new listeners to the podcast, we always at the end of our interview um, have questions or statements for our guests to get to know them a little bit that they don't know what's coming. Um, I have provided the questions before just for pre preparation, you know, in the main segment, but this, you have no idea what I'm about to say. Yeah. And I'm excited. <laughs> All right. So quick beach or mountains beach. Any particular, what favorite beach? Um, anyone period. Any anyone. Beach? Okay. I'll take that back. I was about to say anyone except, and then I feel like that's kind of negative. So, <laughs> uh, the island of Puerto Rico is where my oh, family is. So absolutely. any beach on Puerto Rico. Absolutely. How about what is the most used app on your phone? Probably my email, Outlook email <laughs> for our work. Of course, you conference. get a lot of yes. a lot of incoming email, a lot of um, outgoing email. Mm -hmm. All right. Favorite hobby outside of ministry? Cooking. Specialty. What's what's your um What's your go-to? Like, Robin, cook me your, give me your best meal. What are, you, what are you cooking up? I don't use recipes, so I don't really have names. A lot of vegetables, a lot okay. of beans and rice in our household. All right. So as a tie to that, newlywed, you just, you and Steve got married here. It'll be a year in April. It'll be a year in April. We're, mm -hmm. we'll release this in August. So, it, you know, a year plus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, favorite food that you get to cook for him? He really likes uh, breakfast tacos. Oh, yeah. nice. So every morning I make him breakfast oh, tacos. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. every morning. Yeah. Well, Man. okay. The first time in our marriage this morning, I completely forgot. <laughs> like he's walking out the door and I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go to Whataburger. Get your breakfast yeah. tacos. They won't be as good as mine, but you'll deal with it. One thing on your bucket list. Mm. You know, I... I am an avid coffee drinker, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a special type of coffee called Kopi Luwak. Okay. Uh, I might be saying that wrong. Uh, you'd so be saying it right, and I still wouldn't know. The I... only reason I started drinking coffee is I actually, weird little fact, I have a sleeping disorder. Very slight, but I use that to self-medicate instead of taking stimulants. So on my bucket list is to try this luxurious and expensive coffee. Where's it from? Um, so vets eat the beans and then they. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then they release the beans yes. and the beans are cleaned and you try it. <laughs> I've heard of that. I did. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to, to try that. You better than I am. If <laughs> I'm not even sure how to follow up on that. <laughs> if <laughs> Wow. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Mm, to not have to sleep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because I I need so much of it um, that feeling tired has been a constant in my life. So I would love the ability to not have to sleep and just get up happy or, you know, not even have to get up, just be able to do whatever. So much more time. Okay. All right. <laughs> I hear you. Or I speed cleaning. That would also be one. Speed cleaning. Just, like look at something and everything be clean wow. and organized. Yeah, because that is that is one thing I've gotten to know about you. You like your things mm -hmm. organized. You have one of the nicest offices here in the <laughs> building. The most organized, one of the most organized. It's from being an elementary school teacher. <laughs> <That's> from, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's I'm from sure. being in the classroom. You gotta have you gotta have order in the midst of all that chaos. Last thing, best piece of advice you ever received. Don't take yourself too seriously. I like that. Yeah, I tend to be very uh, regimented and get things done and just to kind of lighten up, you know, laugh. And, and I think you have lived that out in the two years that I've gotten to know you working here. It, it's always fun in those moments because you have those moments here in the office where you get to chat for a little bit and it's not, it's not all about work mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to kind of see you in that non superintendent light where it's just Robin, <laughs> look at that. And she, you know, 
now she likes coffee that it's anyway. <laughs> um, no, it's I, I love that. I love that because you 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 are a consummate professional. Oh, thank you. Um, but more importantly, it's just been fun to to get to know you. And most importantly, though, it's been fun to see you so passionate about Christian mm -hmm. education. Yeah. And what we what we have here in the Texas Conference and throughout the Seventh Day Adventist denomination mm -hmm. when it comes to educating our kids, not just for day to day and reading, writing, and arithmetic, but more importantly, educating them for eternity. Praise God. So, Robin, thank you for this conversation. Yeah. It was fun. Thank I you hope. for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. I I I really appreciated so much of what you said, and we could have gone on much longer. But uh, thank you for your passion for yeah. our kids. Thanks for allowing and, me uh, to talk about it today. So for those of you who are listening, um, again, we release it the third Thursday of the month, and uh, so f if you just found it, subscribe, like it, set a review. We want we want to get this out there. Um, not so that we can go viral, but more importantly, because we can have these conversations within our context, not only here in Texas, but around the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So join us next month as we continue our journey to becoming better leaders. So I look forward to seeing you next month for another episode of Leadership 360.